The first thing I want to do is give you a little bit of context about where I'm coming from. Uh, I recently started a new job just three weeks ago at Alpha, and they're a moonshot factory in Barcelona. They have very lofty goals and aspirations, and they've been growing like crazy. And so in the first two weeks, this is actually my fourth week there, I'm here though. But in the first two weeks, all I did was talk to as many people on the teams as I could to understand who they were, what they do, how they work, where are their pain points, and really, you know, to build my kind of map of, of what this new environment was that I was entering in. And one of the interesting things I found out in these interviews was that the average alpha age of people in this company was less than six months, which is a really interesting thing because every week since I started, at least five to 10 new people have joined. So you can imagine this is like a super fast growing company um, with lots of new people joining and they don't really know how to work together yet. So there's my challenge. Um, the other interesting thing about Alpha is that on, on the second day, there was a big desk move on the floor, and um, before I had started, they decided they were going to form cross-functional teams, and they called them pods. And so basically on day two, people got up and moved to sit with their pods. And I guess um, maybe the assumption was magically the pods would just work super great together. And now here I am. <laughs> um, so what's going to happen today? I don't want to talk about paintball as a team building activity. I don't want to talk about cooking classes. Actually, I love cooking. I used to work as a cook. I learned a lot about teamwork being a cook, but, and I don't want to, you know, talk about taking your team to an escape room. As Sabrina said, these are, these are really fun activities, and, and for sure they can strengthen the social bonds on the team, but those things by themselves are not going to ensure that you build a team. And so um, today, I want to talk about empathy. And empathy is our super secret power. Empathy, I've, I've had so many wonderful, interesting conversations with different people um, in the last couple of days, and we keep coming back to this empathy topic. And it's about, um, first of all, it's about recognizing the emotions in the other person. So being able to like see that other person and, and, and kind of have a sense of what they're feeling. And empathy is about a willingness to step out of your place, step out of your shoes and, and go into the other person's shoes and try to see the world from their perspective and try to understand them as unique human beings just like you are. So for me, the essence of building a team is based on empathy. And so today I'm going to talk you through some um, different ways that we can build empathy on the team. Um, one of the first things I, I like to do when I'm kicking off with a team is something I, I took from Management 3.0 and, it, and it's personal maps. And actually, um, Lizette, in, in her course for engaged remote teams, also recommends using personal maps. And it's a really super interesting exercise. How many of you have done personal maps before with your teams? OK, so quite a few. So I don't, I don't need to belabor the mechanics. Um, this is a picture from a kickoff I did earlier in the year with the other company I was working from. And you can see that some of them you know, were, were quite straightforward in terms of using XMind, I think they used XMind for the mind map, and, and some of us got a little bit more creative, and, and for sure Sabina could help us get better at drawing mind maps. But so what we want with these personal maps is to really um, understand who, who this person that's sitting next to us every day 
really is as a person. Like, who are they? And so this is how we do it. Um, what I usually do with a team is I form the partners, and what I try to do is get people from different disciplines who wouldn't necessarily be talking to each other every day to do that. So I might pair, for instance, a, a QA person with a product manager or a developer with a UX person. You know, think about like the conflicted relationships that you normally see on a team and make those pairs. And so I, uh, before we have the personal maps um, sharing session, I, I make the pairs and I ask them to interview and present their partner to the team. And here's something really interesting when when you're presenting the person to the team rather than pre presenting yourself, all of a sudden you you don't have to worry about being overly boastful about who you are, and it really helps for super introverted, shy people because they don't like to talk about themselves, so having someone else present you takes away that pain. And so, so the framework that I give people for these personal maps is, um, first, ask about family. So, and, and I try to give people like hints about how to do these personal maps interviews. So it's not just kind of sitting together and saying, okay, tell me about your family. It's how big was your family? How many brothers and sisters do you have? Who are your parents? Where are they from? You know, I, you, what you want to do is kind of dig a little bit deeper and find out, is this person an only child? Or, you know, were they in a huge family? Do they have their parents still? These kinds of things. Um, the next one is friends. So who are your friends? Who was your best friend when you were five years old? Uh, what do you do with your friends? Where do you go? What do you do for fun? That kind of thing. Where did you meet them? We talk about school. So I like to ask, who is your favorite teacher when you were in first grade, or what was your favorite subject in school? What, what subject did you hate? You know, it's not necessarily what degree do you have and what did you major in? Of course, those are interesting questions as well, but you, again, try and, and extend the interview, make it a little bit deeper. We talk about work. Um, I like to ask, what was the weirdest job you had? Um, what was the worst job you had? And again, where did you learn what you know how to do now? Um, an interesting anecdote was I was doing a personal map for a former colleague of mine, and he had started out as a uh, test manager, and then he moved into the product manager role. And one of the jobs that he had when he was, I think he was in high school, one of the jobs he had was making sure that um, in this giant parking lot, they could fit as many cars as they could in, that, in, that, in those tight spaces. And when he said that, it totally made sense in terms of how he organized his backlog because he was really precise and super organized and, and made as much as he could fit in there as possible. And I could see that connection with the, the parking lot job. Um, we talk about where people have lived, so have they always stayed close to home? Have they moved around a lot? Do they live in a city? Do they live in the country? You can see, it's, you start getting some richer details. We talk about hobbies, what do you do for fun? Um, do you play music? You start finding the commonalities there. Um, and then we talk about what are your personal goals for this year? So you, you, you interview your partner, you say, okay, what, what's your personal goal for this year? And having that information actually helps you carry the conversation further after this personal map sharing exercise because you can keep, help each other keep track of, of your goals and support each other. And finally, what are your values? So what's really important to you? And so doing this personal map, um, presenting it to the rest of the team gives a wider perspective really on, on who these individuals are in your team and what are they about and where, what are they bringing with them to this team. So personal maps is the first um, item. Then what I get into when I kick off with a team is an exercise about roles and expectations. And this is probably one of the sources of a lot of conflict on the teams. Either 
either the expectations um, are misunderstood or they haven't been articulated clearly enough. And so what might happen is I expect something from Alex and he should know that because it's common knowledge that anyone in his position would do it, but he doesn't know it because I haven't made my, my expectation explicit. And, and the other important part of this exercise is to separate the role from the person, right? So we want to be really clear on our team what we expect from each of our specialty roles. And, and then, yes, there's a person who's fulfilling that role, but, but when we have problems with the expectations, it's not about the person, it's about not understanding those expectations. And so how does this one work? So... I make flip chart papers. You can see this one is for developers. I like putting the photos of the people who are in those roles. And I basically paste them all over the room, empty, with three questions. And the first question is, what qualities does your perfect whatever display? And this is really kind of the heart of, you know, what should this person provide to the team on a day-to-day -day basis. For instance, um, you know, I expect my product owner to be really clear about what the priorities are, and, and I expect my product owner to um, continually share feedback that they're receiving from the customer, this kind of stuff. So you know, what do you expect from this role? The second question is, what does your whatever, what does your product owner need to know about you so that you can work well together. And this is about getting the people into the mode of being able to express what they need. So it's important, for instance, that um, one of the ones that comes up a lot is developers want their product owner to know that it's important to come with problems, not solutions, right? So, so let us figure out the best way to do it. Please don't tell us exactly what, you know, to do, but give us the problem. It, this was in a previous talk, right? Give us the problem, give us the problem, not the plan, I think was, was it what it was. And the third question is, how can you support your product manager, developer, whatever, to do a brilliant job? And the purpose of this question is to get people to start thinking about helping each other. So this is really important when you're build, building a team that it's not just this mini waterfall in, in a sprint where everyone's handing off between the roles, which has been described earlier, but that each of us can help each other do a brilliant job. And so when we run the exercise, I, I ask the team to just break, into, break themselves off into groups. They, write post-its that answer each of the questions, and then um, whoever's in that role at the end gathers around, sorts through all the post-its, and they put question marks on the things that aren't clear, they put X's on the things that they don't think they're responsible for, and then we have a conversation about it. And this is, this is actually where the beauty of this exercise comes out, because now we're talking about where we're overlap, where there's a gap. So I expect something from someone, but they don't think it's their responsibility. We talk about the overlaps. So I think this person or this role is responsible for it, but another role thinks they're also responsible for it. And we decide together as a team, how do we deal with the gaps and how do we deal with the overlaps? And it's a process, it's a conversation. So that's the second step, roles and expectations. Um, the third one is about establishing team norms. And Lisette talked a lot about this earlier, about creating this team working agreement. And, and norms are, for me, norms are behaviors that you accept or that you reject. So if people come late to meetings and I don't say anything about it, then it's a team norm that we're late to meetings. We're not, it's not important for us that we're on time. What's tricky about this one 
is, again, um, recognizing that each of us comes from different backgrounds, from different cultures, and, and understanding that um, what might be unacceptable to me is perfectly fine for you. For you. And some examples of this might be um, interrupting each other in meetings. Like, is it okay for me to stop stop while you're talking and, and throw my idea across? Or, or how we disagree. Is it okay for me to actually tell you, no, I don't agree with you, or do I have to like do it in some other way because of my family history? So it's really important that the team establishes their norms. How are we going to behave with each other? And again, to be explicit about it. So what's the exercise? Um, this is actually, this is from a, the dojo that Crystal and I did last year, where we were talking about understanding on, on teams. And so it's a three-part exercise. Um, the first thing is to have the team think back to the best team that they were ever on and to write on Post-its all the different qualities of that team. What was it about that team that made it the best? The second, obviously, is to think about the worst team you've been on. So what was like really shitty about it? And why was it such a terrible experience? And again, write the Post-its. Um, the third step is the most valuable and important part of the exercise. So this is the harvesting. And your role as a facilitator, facilitator of this is to let the harvesting happen with the team. So please don't go up there and help them and organize it for them. Please let the team move stuff around and figure out you know, what are the common things. And what you want to encourage them to do is really pare it down to the essential, especially with a brand new team. So I'm looking for maybe up to 10 max norms that we're going to follow. And like Lisette said earlier, this is a living document. So you need to constantly go back and refine it, revisit it. Are some of these things no longer necessary? Are there new things, maybe because we're now remote or whatever? Um, to help spur the, the interaction, there's some questions that you could ask as a facilitator. So a really important one is, what, is, what does this norm look like in practice? Again, we have different understandings of, of some of these really big words like agile or polite or, I don't know, fast or effective. So be really, you know, ask people to describe um, in as rich a description as they can, what does this look like when it's happening? What does this norm look like? And the other important question is, what do we do if someone is not behaving according to the team norms. So how are we going to reject that behavior? How are we going to remind each other of what the norms are? Not easy. I'm not saying it's super easy, but it's important conversations that need to happen. Um, so one useful framework for team norms are the core protocols from Jim and Michelle McCarthy. Did, how many of you guys know about Core protocols, OK, cool. Some of my favorites are check-in and check-out and pass. Um, the decider protocol is a really interesting one. When um, Manuel yesterday was talking about the advice process, it's very similar to the decider protocol. Intention check is a core protocol, which is basically enabling you to inquire when someone on your team is not upholding one of the team norms. And one of my big favorites is ask for help, so that we are always um, creating that psychologically safe environment where we can ask stupid questions and we can ask for help and, and not be worried about being judged. So I strongly encourage you to go to the McCarthy Show website, check out the core protocols, check out the core commitments. Um, and there's a huge collection of podcasts that Jim and Michelle have shared with everyone that go really deep on what these core protocols are. Uh, next. So then the last step is what I call toning the feedback muscle. And, and thanks, Alex and Sabrina, for, for kind of 
introducing us all to this idea of feedback. It's super important, and you know, like Alex said, no one's no one's given a course on how to receive feedback, and many people don't even know how to give feedback. Um, so, what are some things that we could do? My favorite, <laughs> the thing that changed my life: nonviolent communication. Um, strongly urge you to read the book by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, the perfection game, it's another one of the core protocols. I'll start with MVC. So MVC, it, in a very short nutshell, because I'm running out of time, MVC is you start with observations, uh, and these are factual. So what did the person say, or what did they do? Free of judgment. So don't put any elaboration on on uh, kind of adjectives or adverbs, just this happened, you said this, this is what I saw. And then you talk about how that made you feel. So why, why did this particular behavior um, trigger you in a certain way? And what did you feel from that? And um, again, if we go back to the happy force thing, it could make you happy, it could make you angry, it could make you sad, it could make you confused. This is you um, understanding for yourself what you're feeling. And then the next part is bringing that back to the need. So bringing it back to the team norms. You know, what is, what, what's from what's important for us to do on our team is, is not being met when you do have this particular comment or, or do this particular behavior. And the last step in MVC is, is to make a request. And this is actually the collaboration part where you, are, you and the person that you're giving this feedback to are working together to find a solution. I might make a request of you and, it, and you don't want to fulfill that. And that's perfectly OK. But at least you know, we're agreeing to find this common ground where we can work well, better together. Um, perfection game is a little bit different. so. What you do in perfection game is you, you can perfect anything, really. You can perfect a meeting. You can per perfect an artifact. You can perfect a person. Um, the important thing to keep in mind when you're playing perfection game is that if you're doing it for a person, that person has to ask to be perfected. So I'm not going to go to Sabrina and say, oh, Sabrina, I'm going to perfect you today. She has to ask me. <laughs> she wants, wants to be perfected. And so what, what happens with perfection game is you give a rating, a number rating, on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 is absolutely perfect, never attainable. It means that we're all God. So, and, and like any feedback, you know, it's, if you think of feedback as a gift that you're giving to another person rather than an I'm right, you're wrong. Um, this, this perfection game will help you a lot. So, so what I like to do is give a gift of rating something fairly low. Like people like to rate things kind of in the eight, nine, which doesn't give actually a lot of room for improvement, right? And it's kind of being too nice. Like I want, when I, want, when I get feedback or when I give feedback, I want to give something valuable to that person so they know how they can get better. It's just like what we were talking about earlier about um, coaches, right? So I don't want my coach to be nice to me. I want my coach to tell me how I can get better and, and like be like super high performing. So, so the rating comes first. Then you say what that what is happening there that contributes to the rating. So you're always um, kind of slanting it in a positive way. And then the last part is, what could that person do to make it a perfect 10? And that's where really the request part of the feedback comes in. Um, and then the third one from Management 3.0 is called a feedback wrap. And that's very similar to MVC. Um, you describe the context. You share the facts and observations. You, talk, you share your feelings about it. Um, you talk about the impact of that behavior, and then you, again, make a request at the end. So how can we make this better? You explore options together. It's not just, you have to do this, but would you be willing to, the, to do this? And do you have any ideas that I haven't thought of that we can make this better? So um, this feedback muscle, I can't stress it enough. Like, any opportunity, like, you have to keep 
working that muscle, otherwise it will atrophy. And when it atrophies, then your team will be broken because then people aren't really engaged with each other. They're not, they're not helping each other grow and they're not helping each other be the best person on that team that they can be. Um, five minutes, okay. Uh, I'm gonna skip haptic tricks. I'll say one thing about haptic tricks. So, so I know I said, uh, you know, for team building, I'm not really into starting out with paintball or cooking class or escape rooms. Um, one thing I do like to do, though, is improv theater. Has anyone done improv here? Yeah, okay, cool. And what I usually do is I, I bring actually an ex expert in who does improv for a living, and he runs this through um, a variety of improv theater exercises, but the, the magic in it is, A, you're getting totally out of your comfort zone, so a lot of people are just like, I'm not an actor, I don't want to like make a fool of myself, but you know, we're all going to make fools of ourselves in this exercise. But it's also about having this physical awareness of each other, so this acknowledgement of the other person's presence on the team. But I'm, I'm going to have to do another talk about it. What did you say, Angel? Like, that's another talk for another time or something, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap it up. So here's a takeaway then. Um, remember empathy. It is the foundation on which you can build a great team. Get to know each other on the team. So tell stories. Give some more details. Get rich with it. Be clear on the team about what are the different roles and what are your expectations of those roles. Agree together on how you're going to behave and keep that living agreement. And finally, exercise your feedback muscles. And I put a cat before, but I'm, I love my dogs. Those are my dogs. Um, so I just thought I'd put that in there. Uh, you, you can find me on Twitter there. and. Shameless self-promotion, I just launched an online course about agile anti-patterns where we talk about, you know, all the, it's not really agile. Um, and you can find the course there. And thanks very much, everybody.